Now in the previous video we were looking at this VCR NV870 and trying to debug why it doesn't seem to power up properly and we trace the problem back to a oscillator on one of the ICs on the timer board not running and I tried forcing a clock signal into it and that didn't get it to run so I've dug out another NV870 VCR here and supposedly this one works so oh, that's what I had at notes about it is that this one was working well so we'll test it out now and then if it does work well we'll take the timer board out of it and stick it into the other VCR that we we're trying to get going to prove the fault only lies on the timer board and if that works then we might try taking that IC out where that clock was not running and sticking it in the other board to see if we can solve the problem but I'm not that sure about messing up this good one assuming it's still good we'll find out in a few minutes we'll just take the top off so we can have a look while it's running we'll switch that on yes and the clock turns on it powers up so that seems to be in reasonable order we'll join this video signal onto it so we can see what comes out of it and we'll try playing the tape and so it was that IC which we were concerned about or which seemed to have the problem let's see oh it's a bit weak on yeah I think that idle is a bit wrecked on that so it might chew the tape out, let's just try it anyway. Well, it seems to be okay. Well, not doing too well. On There's nothing coming up on the capture, and on my monitor here it's just saying unsupport signal. Yeah, there's a little bit of stuff fluffing around on the waveform there. And I think it's just a bit un too unstable for it. If we had an analog monitor to get one of those out, we might be able to get a picture. Anyway, we've proven that this is more or less running and that was the important part because we want to test this in the other VCR. Mm, that's it as well. Okay, so we're going to get this apart and get that board out. Lucario is there helping to undo the screws. So we're taking the front panel board off because that's part of this board here then that will lift up and it's on hinges so we need to undo all that usually these have they have the connector numbers written on them so it's easy to know where things go back the more difficult thing is getting the lay of the cables right so it'll look perfect as it was from you now we need something to undo those clips. The pliers like that. So this is the good one. And now we've got to take the dud one out of the other machine. I'm going to put a mark on that. So that I know that that is the bad one. And now we've got to do the same. Get all this stuff out of here. Okay. Dud board is out of the way. And now we're going to try install this in here, just temporarily, just to try it out. And if it's good, then we'll decide what to do next. All right, we're going to power this up, and we'll see. Does the clock come on correctly now? Oh, well, the clock's flashing, but this display here has still got a mess on it, so that means not completely good. Hmm, that's interesting. An unexpected eventuality. <laughs> we can set the clock, but something's up with that. That's only audio stuff, so that doesn't matter. I wonder if there's still some other power supply issue. Because as we measured before, the 5 volts seemed a little bit low. Maybe that needs tweaking up as well. We'll just try sticking a tape in there anyway and see if it does anything interesting. Hmm. It doesn't want to be 
trying to fast forward, I think there's something wrong with the sensor. I'm just not going to eject it either. Okay, so there's more stuff to investigate. And I might have to sit and read this service manual for a while to work out what things I need to measure and check next. Here's another this display which has those symbols on it. It's got a processor. I think that's under the under the display, which we didn't look at at all before. We only focused on the timer and your operation PCB. So there's the layout of it. So there's two ICs underneath that display. And here's the circuit. So that's also got a crystal. Well, it's got its own reset generator there. And it looks like that just receives serial clock serial data from two mains. So that comes from somewhere. System control, 5 volt. We should measure those voltages first. Somewhere on here we need to look at E6501. Which is that one there. Then we need to get scope out again and then look at reset pulses and sync and that clock and data signal. The ground is going to be that second to last one. We'll look for the AC 6 volts first, which is 6 volts AC. You have minus 28 volts. Yeah, minus 29 and a half, so that's pretty close. And then system control 5 volts on here. 4 and a half. Now perhaps we should try boosting the 5 volts up a bit. So there is an adjustment for that. We'll go to the adjustment section of the service manual. And I need to work out where the test point was. So it's got here. Power supply section, regulator 5 volt adjustment. So it says TP103 and you're adjusting VR1003. But I'm not sure where those are. Maybe they're on the bottom. There's a power supply section on here. Yes, look at that. There is TP103 there, and the adjustment is there. And we need some sort of ground somewhere. Didn't tell you what to use as a ground. That's it, they don't give you any other information about what to do, it just says do that. Oh yeah, there's a trouble there, see it's pulsing. Ah, okay, it already is 5.1. Exactly, so there's nothing wrong with that. That's surprising. So why is the voltage down a bit on other boards? There must be another 5 volt signal from somewhere. We need to look at the layout of those power supplies. So we were on this here 5 volt adjustment. And the test point for it must be there. Switch regulated 5 volts. And we already checked these and they seemed pretty good. Oh, there's a different one. System control 5 volt which is regulated 6 volts with a diode voltage drop. Perhaps we should check that. That's D1006. I wonder where that is. We should measure that, both sides of that diode, and see what that has on it. 5.3, 4.6. Mm, not. It means the, the regulated 6 volts is a little bit down. I wonder what that comes from. And what is it set by? It's set by a Zener diode there and a transistor. We need to check that with a scope and see see if it's oscillating or it's noisy or got something weird going on with it. 20 millivolts per division looks pretty clean. Doesn't really seem to have anything wrong with it. There's a little bit of ripple. 20 millivolts of ripple, that doesn't really matter. It's just a bit low. Just wondering, can I trigger it to do something? It doesn't swing around, so it's pretty stable. See, switching the power on and off makes a bit of a notch in it. Maybe that's a problem. There's a little bit of a spike and a recovery when the standby gets turned on and off. I wonder if that's enough to upset it. Although it's only changing by some number of millivolts. Yeah, less than 100 millivolts spike. So I don't think that's really a problem. And I'm suspicious of that being not 5 volts and not 6 volts. It's, it's a bit low. Something is up there that needs investigating. So that's on one of these things. Either the one that's on there or the one that's on there. What one is it? So regulated 6 volts. It comes from that. So it's not the heater one, it's the other one. It's that one there. I wonder if that's gone bad. That's this. 
does look kind of crusty. Ah, it looks like it has a dry joint on that. What if we can get a, a microscope camera in there and suss it out? Now, that looks like a dry joint there. It looks like a cracked solder joint. And that looks like one that's been kind of touched up, but it's got some problems. Perhaps we should resolder that and then see if it makes a difference. I wonder if there's been an intermittent connection on that power supply and that maybe that's what burned out the chip on the timer board. Try this thing. Haven't used that before. Yeah, people seem to like this type of soldering iron, but I'm not very happy with how long that is compared to the Heiko style, the T12 stuff, which gives you gets you quite close to the action. Anyway, so we've got to resolder that. The problem is these things been sitting sitting there smoking away for 20 years or whatever, and so the solder's gone all crusty and doesn't want to adhere to anything. I suppose that's when you get out your flux, isn't it? I like to pour flux all over everything these days. Get good quality solder that's got flux in it. And then you normally don't need any more. Okay, we just got to get a bit of wick or a desolder pump. Just to... Yeah, see, that's where a short tip comes in handy so that you can hold stuff close enough without burning your fingers. Yeah, that cleared it up. Great. Yeah, there's lots of juicy flux in there now. Anyway, look at that, it's all crusty. But, I'm pretty sure that's soldered now, even though it looks kind of gross. I think it's, it's probably some of the original old school flux from the original soldering of that. But it's actually joined now, which is the thing we're looking for. Alright, let's put this there, so it's not shorting out. And we'll power this up again, and we'll check that 5 volts. Well, that 5 volts was under it. Let's just power it up briefly and see what happens. And it doesn't want to turn on at all now. So we ruin it. I didn't think it was shorted up. Let's just check this if there's anything shorted there. No, that seems fine. Okay, I've run out of time, so I'm going to have to continue this at another time. Pretty weird though. Found a dry joint. There was definitely something wrong there. And now it's unhappy about something. The place where we were measuring that 6 volts. Probably got nothing on it now. 5.3. Oh, so it's the same as it was before. So we haven't ruined that. And 4.5. The voltage is still low. It hasn't changed at all. So even though they had a crack in the solder joint, it must have just been touching just enough to work. So we haven't ruined that. But now the clock. You see that? It seems like another power supply is unstable and when the load of this powering up comes there it sags down. So we need to probe the other power supplies while it's doing that and see which one it is. I think we can put that back now because we've worked out that it's not an issue anymore. Well, actually it is still an issue because the voltage isn't 6 volts. So we might have to check the zener that's on there. I guess we can get the one out of the other VCR and try it in here. The unplugs at that end. Come back after a while of not working on this to carry on. And where we left last time was it appeared that there was something wrong with the power supply because there was pulsing, pulsing of that and the operate light was coming on and off. And I poked it around for a while and I thought it was this and we found a dry joint or cracked solder joint and fixed it but actually it's this when I touch that it turns on and off and when I looked at the schematic again I see that I had looked at the wrong thing before regulated 6 volt supply comes off of the cylinder heater not the power transistor PCB so not that, it's this. And I pulled that out to take a look at it. And there's a dry joint there. Well, a cracked solder joint. Looks like the pad's ripped off of the board. So I went to grab the one out of the other NV870 to put that in and try it. But I see this one is just as bad. If we have a look close up. The one we took out 
can't actually see immediately what's going on there, but those solder blobs seem to have separated from the PCB, although that normally wouldn't cause trouble. It's only when it actually cracks. Maybe it's damaged the... Uh, yeah, see, it might have peeled itself off of the pad there as well. Yeah, maybe it's cracked off. And then if we look at the other one, this is probably in better shape because all that's really happened is there's cracking of the solder. I don't think the pads have ripped off. That one probably still works as is because it's probably okay around the other side. But let's resolder this one at least and then try it and see what happens. So because of that, I've also pulled this thing out and started looking at it, but it doesn't seem to be anything visibly messed up with those ones. Leave some nice fresh solder in there, which will get new flux into it. And we'll have a go at measuring that soon too, because I want to see why is the 6 volts and then consequently the 5 volts a bit low. Do not want it low, we want it normal. Now I have been wondering, since the the other, the operation display on the front is still showing as though it's not running or initialized. Is it possible that due to the bad connection, connection on that transistor that there was some sort of spike on the power supply which damaged the microcontrollers? The clock one and the, the operation display. Those are resoldered now whether they needed it or not. And we'll turn this on again. Power's up okay. No, oh, it's still intermittent. I think that connector there is bad. Doesn't seem to be that end. Seems to be fine now. There is exposed metal on the edge there, so if there's something down in there, it isn't. Don't know. Anyway, it seems pretty stable now. It turns on. Wiggle that around. Fine. To the there's one chip that controls this part of the display, which is separate to the audio part. Uh, we need to take a look at that and see what's going on. The clock is all happy now. You can set the clock. And it runs. The tuner is okay. So we've got to take a look at this board, Operation PCB, and see what's going on there. Okay, I think I've worked out what's going on here, what's wrong here is that voltage that goes into the transistor there on the voltage going into the regulator has got major ripple on it and that will be, that is a problem that means the caps on that board are done, no longer functioning so we're measuring between there, which should be 9.6 but it shows as sort of 10, 12-ish but when you look on the scope, you get this triangle wave shape, which is not what you want. And that's that's AC coupled 200 millivolts per division. So it's going up and down by about a volt. Is not really what you want on a power supply that's supposed to be 9.6 volts. So let's turn it off, because it's probably dodgy. And we're going to take this out. And we're going to investigate the capacitors, and we're probably going to have to change them all. This is going to have to come out as well, because it's part of the deal. I think there'll be some screws from the back. Yeah, so what they do is one one of the screws, which is, turns out to be that one, just goes into the metal work, and the other one goes through into the, the body. The plastic. Possible that... Let me get that screw out of the way so it doesn't fall and cause a problem. So what we're the one that we were looking at, this, the supply is that. So it's C1101. No, no, no. This is C1104. C1104. So where's that? There. So I guess that's wrecked. We've got a 16 volt 2200, 25 2200, 25 4700, and two little ones 6300 and 100. I guess we'll just replace all of them. Uh, there's 2547, 25,000, 6 volts 47. Take out these caps and we'll measure them. The one we're interested in at the moment is the 104. Trusty component tester, where's that gone? 
thing. Let's see what it says. It's probably wrecked. Hmm. Okay, it says it's fine. Is it possible we've got some other issue like a rectifier's gone bad? Okay, what about this? 25,200? Hmm. Okay. Measures okay. 25,400. Oh, that had charge on it. It's probably wrecked this tester now. Yeah, maybe we should have discharged them. Uh, yeah, I think that's wrecked now. Yeah, so always remember to discharge capacitors before you stick them on a capacitorometer. Okay, we'll use the multimeter then. Hmm, 2800. So it seems to think the capacitors are fine. What was all that ripple we were seeing? Alright, we're going to get some other capacitors and stick them in. Okay, I haven't really found... I haven't found good capacitors. Got these. 1200 microfarad 35 volts, a bunch of those. And I got these 1000 microfarad 35 volts. We're going to use one of those to replace the 1000 microfarad 25 volt. And I found this one, which is a 2216. So that is a direct replacement, that's the only. But we still got to replace a 2200 and a 4700. And I was thinking, do we just put a bunch of these in parallel with 1109? And then we got this 2216. Is that the one that we suspect was bad? Yeah. Okay, so that's one of four. Okay, so that's those two covered. Now we need to work out what to do. 2225. That's that one. So we could put two in parallel for that. Anyway, that makes a bigger cap. Now what are we going to do for the other one? We've got to stick four or five of these caps together, haven't we? Well, that can be arranged. So that's that. That's the 2225 done. Now, 4725 volt. So we've got 4800 with four of them. Two more on that. Not very good for impedance, is it? Because one of them long legs far away from the others. This is just low frequency stuff, so that will go there. And then we got our 4,800 microfarad capacitor. Okay. Awesome. 4,800 microfarads. All around the same way, which is good. And we'll install that. I don't know if that will fit back in the cabinet, but we'll see. So let's try it out. Hopefully they won't touch things that they're not supposed to be touching. Hopefully we put them around the right way. Looks like they're around the right way. Oh, we should do a solder at the ground test point while we're in here. Okay. All right, we've got a ground test point. Got that attached. I'm going to work out how to get this thing back in. Oh, no, the capacitors are in the way. The tuner board's kind of squishing the capacitor thing a bit. Let's just turn it on and see what happens. So we're going to measure that again to just see if we've made an improvement there. Hasn't made any difference. Okay, so maybe those caps were fine. But yeah, when you turn the power on, the ripple is enormous now. More like 2 volts per division. Maybe it's okay. Um, let's measure the voltage. 10.4. It says 9.6. Is that closer than it was before? Might be. 5.7, so it is closer to 6 volts now. So I guess that's good. Ah, look, and also... Oh no, that's not that much different. That was 7. It was 20 before. Now it's 19. So that has... That has calmed them down a bit. So I think we're in a... In a... Better condition now. I don't know if that means... It's gonna work or anything. Let me just sort out that front display. And that, why does it go into fast forward mode? And it also won't eject. Yeah, we need to sort out the operations board. That works properly now. Before the belt was slipping, which is interesting. Yeah, I guess it was just that one time then. Okay, well I think we've 
got the power supply closer to what it's supposed to be. The voltages are a bit better. We check on this board. Where that was. The system control 5 volts. Operation volumes. Look at that soon. 4.9. So before we were around 4.5. So that's definitely an improvement. There's a little ripple on there. Very clean. Okay. So now we will change attention to the operation board. So this part works. That's got its own chip there. There's the meter drive IC. And then this side, which is not working, it's got this, which is some microcontroller. It has a crystal there, or oscillator of some sort. They don't tell you what the frequency should be. Some sort of reset generator thing. Uses the system control 5 volts. Goes into VDD and also into this pin there. It says it should be 4.9. So would this not working affect the other operation of the machine? I don't think so because this is just yeah this can't do any feedback it only has a serial input connected no serial output so it's only a display so there's nothing really else we can do if it's not working there's a microcontroller of a built-in VFD driver it just takes the minus 28 in there the heater just connects onto the tube anyway let's check the voltages on there because that comes from timer and that comes from main to secure some of the stuff so it doesn't go flying away when we tip it up. Okay, we've got these connectors here. P6501, ground on the second to last, and then 5 volts on pin 1. Yeah, 4.95, that's pretty close. I don't know what else we can do really. Check for the serial data. Join a ground to there. Now we need to work out what is 7 and 8 serial clock. Not seeing anything on those. Oh, we have to turn it on. Mm, not getting anything on those. That one there, serial data just seems to be stuck high. There's no data on these data lines or the clock line. And they're both inputs to this board, so that explains why that's stuck. It's because it's never sent any data. What we do want to do though is check the, the reset and oscillator on this board. So we'll try pull it off and see if we can check those before we move on. Let me take it out because we'll have to measure it from the back side because the ICs are covered by the display. So we could just swap the board with the other one from the other machine, but if the cl clock on this is working and the reset pulse is working, then there won't be any point swapping it with one from the other machine because it's pretty much would work if it had the data being sent to it. So we've got a reset generator type thing going on there, which goes to pin 1, and this is IC503. So it's that one there that has high density line of ground somewhere on this. Pin 42 is ground. See all that work? I'll try and capture it. Nope. Let's look for the clocks then. Okay. Doesn't seem to be going at all. Maybe this board does have a problem then? Does this mean every microcontroller in this in this thing is wrecked? No, I guess we'll try getting the display, this display from the other machine and see if it comes to life. Because it doesn't look like the clock is running on this. Don't get anything on either of the oscillator pins. So I guess that means this is wrecked or not working. Yeah, we'll recover the one from the other machine and we'll try it here and see if. That display comes up differently. Got the other board out. See what happens. Crusty down there. It's hard to see. The display looks kind of frosty or dull in that one. Guessing eventually we'll just have moved all of the parts from the other machine into this one. We haven't actually repaired anything. We just swapped everything over. Oh well. Let's turn it on. Huh. Yeah, I guess that board was dead because now it comes up properly like it should do with the clock. Yeah, this display is in way worse condition. So does that mean the microcontroller is wrecked on this? It's interesting that multiple microcontrollers that are connected to the same 5 volt rail seem to be wrecked.
Ah, uh, since this comes up, that must mean the data is there on this one. Yep, there's data there. Huh, does that mean it was shorted out from the other one? That's very bizarre because the data comes into this. So this this doesn't influence what's being sent to it unless it is shorting it out. Very weird. Let's just have a look at the resistance that we get then. If we go between the ground pin. Well, the thing is, when it's powered up, it could be doing something to them. Yeah, so they're not shorted. That is very weird, though. Which makes me think it will work now, because whatever was upsetting that data is not being upset now. So will this do more than it did before? Yes, look at that. The eject works. Which means it probably will respond. It's not trying to one run that anymore. Which means it should respond to fast forward. Rewind. Probably play. Yes, but let's not do that yet because we've got to clean everything up. So the conclusion at the moment is there was something wrong with this board, which we can only assume was the microcontroller because it didn't have a clock, but it had power going to it. Oh, we didn't actually check if it had power going to it, did we? It doesn't actually go through anything to get to it, it's just the power goes in. And similarly on the timer board, the other chip there seemed to be just dead, didn't have a clock. And they share a power supply, so possibly the crack in the solder joint there caused some glitch on the power supply which popped two microcontrollers maybe let's check the power supply voltage now is it different to what it was before 5.78 no it's pretty much the same okay we'll fit this board in properly sort of thinking should we try swapping the microcontrollers over let's clean up all the mechanical bits and pieces first and then perhaps as a final bit we'll try swapping microcontrollers if we want to do something extra painful and annoying just to prove it finally I guess but let's get into the mechanical work of getting this thing tidied up just the fun stuff that I normally like doing and usually touch the electronics if it doesn't turn on we just chuck it away but in this case it was interesting to try and debug it. Okay, let's look at giving this thing a mechanical overhaul to see what its deal is. So in this mechanism, a red screw ground wire, and then there's two red screws down here. So this machine, unlike that G20 and 21 that we were looking at, can just take out the cassette loading mechanism arbitrarily because it it isn't mechanically tied to the rest of the system. It's got its own motor and switches and things. So when you need to do servicing you can just pull it out easily. You don't have to worry about anything. Let's unplug that cable. Now we can see the back tension band has fallen off. So I'm hoping it will sit there long enough that we can just use the machine as is. Take a look at the controller. Crusty. And then the capstan's got. Yeah, I think this has been. Ah. Yeah, look at this. There's a line down there. And there's also a line of crusty, rusty stuff on the capstan there. So I reckon this machine failed while it was playing and then sat for a long time with that rammed up against the capstan and that's yeah, led to that going quite bad. That's interesting. I don't think that was the case when I received this machine. I'm pretty sure I had nothing... Pretty sure it came from a servicing place and it was just in their junk pile. Leaky 
Cut. Let's try and slice that stuff off. I was wondering if we could pull the capstan out completely to clean this, but... With the angle of the knife, it shouldn't wreck the original chrome type finish on the shaft, but it will cut off any detritus that's hanging onto it. Really though, you'd just replace the capstan spindle mag magnet thing. It will come out as one thing, you better get it out through the bottom. Uh, maybe unscrew those and rip that whole mounting thing off. But to win up buying any new parts, we're just... Okay, let's try using one of these things to clean it. Just get a bit of a wipe down, get some tissues and wipe everything down, and then we'll get heads cleaned. Then we'll wipe down all these rollers to get those in good condition. Well, they won't return to good condition, but they'll at least function for long enough that we can try this machine out. See what kind of condition the head's in, there's a crust on it. And it looks a little bit worn. Hopefully it will have a bit of life left in it though for us. I don't know if the one in the other machine's any better. It does look a bit used, there's marks on the bottom there. Okay, well, we'll get some other bits and pieces. Right, so I've decided that we'll use the pinch roller from the other machine because it's in surprisingly good condition. You can see the difference there. The one that we've pulled out is all shiny and it's got that mark on it that we saw. Whereas this is completely still a dull finish, so that's good. We'll put that back in. We'll put put it in from the other machine. Retainer's in really good condition too, which is surprising. Because the one in the other machine was snapped, so it just slid off real easily. Now I've cleaned out uh, to some degree the bits and pieces. Give these rollers and things a final going over. Get rid of dust and oils and grit and things. On all the bits that are going to touch the tape. Now I'm going to clean the head, paper here for that. Sort of dirty, not too bad. Okay, yeah, there's a bit of stuff on there. Some kind of smear on there. Seems to be running okay. I don't know if the, the drum is going to go bad. It's a little bit dull in parts. It's got to be nice and smooth so the tape will glide over it properly. There's a little bit of stuff coming off. Still got stuff coming off of it. A few more times. Alright. That's probably enough of that. We need to get the that idler thing cleaned because that wasn't running very well. It's probably disintegrating. To do what we can. Clean these bits where they roll. Yeah, that's probably really had it, unfortunately. Wondering, is there an easy way we can run this? So I've got this tape here, special just a shell, and you use that to get it in the machine, and then you can check the tension and of the take up and the feed without risking chewing up a good tape. Okay, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we also have to sort out the belt on the loading mechanism. Okay, so we've got the belt here on this loading mechanism that. It's gone bad. I put this little clip thing so that you can, if you're careful, get this shaft out. And then the belt can be replaced. Or in this case, just cleaned. Yeah, the belt's gone hard. Oh well can rejuvenate it a little bit with some isopropyl alcohol but yeah, reality is it's wrecked that little clip thing back on 
Okay, let's get this back into position. So it engages at the back or the front edge with latches. And put that ground wire back on so we don't forget it and it doesn't short out on something else. Might as well tighten that back up too since that's also grounding might be important. Alright, well let's fire this thing up and see if anything exciting happens. We might as well, in anticipation, connect up the video output. Okay, we'll put in the special test tape. Go into play mode. No take up. Oh no, no capstan. What's going on there? Oh, is this control a messed up? Okay, and we've got take up, so you can reach in there and feel what it's like. And you can also reach in there and move the little, the back tension arm there and check that it releases the um, force of the supply reel. And that's all fine. Okay, and we're getting just snow noise on the waveform monitor. So that's all good. Alright. Let's risk putting an actual tape in it and see what that does. Looks like we rejuvenated the belts, okay. Huh. Okay. Okay, so that's the back tension there that's making it a bit of a squeal. I think that the picture looks alright. Wow, that tracking's way over to one side. We've got slow motion. And there's a slow tracking adjustment. Yeah, I think this tape was recorded on another machine and the tracking's a bit off. But that's quite promising, because that appears to be working exciting. With a different tape, it seems to be working okay. Pretty good picture. We'll check the slow motion. It's pretty clean, slow. That's quite nice, and you can adjust the speed of it with these plus and minus buttons. And then there's pause, and then there's an advance on that, frame by frame. So this is the only tape I know of that I can get to at the moment that has hi-fi sound on it, but it was recorded on a JVC semi-professional SVHS machine and the tracking is quite a bit off compared to what these consumer machines have, so it has a lot of trouble locking in. You can see you can put the display into tracking mode. and try and get it right but yeah, as high as you can get it it's just not quite good enough to lock into the hi-fi sound now, i wonder if that was to do with the back tension being off but you know, when you give it a little poke the tracking just goes worse yeah, i think there's also a very critical alignment between where the control head is and the video heads and hi-fi heads so that might be slightly different in the JVC machine alright so we got a machine going again so that's quite exciting uh, this thing wouldn't have run for more than 20 years as I keep saying so perhaps we'll try changing the chips over, take this out and put it into that other board and maybe the other one, perhaps we'll try the display one first since that's a smaller chip with less pins but that's going to have to be another day. Continuing on, we have taken the other board and marked 
what we think is a dead chip and pulled back the display got those brackets off sort of and I'm going to desolder this well we'll see how easy it is to desolder that chip and if it comes out without too much difficulty we'll take that chip out of this working board that we borrowed from the other machine and stick it into this one into this board which originally came from this machine and we'll prove if that was the chip or not if that's successful then we might do the same thing with this board which is the also board we borrowed from the other machine take the chip stick it in the original board see if it gets working it's a shame you can't easily get access to it because that display is in the way and yeah, I don't really want to bend its legs too much and I also don't really want to desolder at all because that's heaps more pins to desolder anyway we'll have a go at desoldering the CPU display driver thing it is a fine pitch that's normal 2.54 millimeter pitch that is something else it's probably two it might be smaller than two it is two millimeter pitch anyway that doesn't matter got a desoldering tool here I'll give it a go I tried getting new tips for this mach this desoldering tool but the ones they sent didn't fit properly even though I'd ordered the right part numbers apparently doesn't look like we need to add any more solders because it's good lead solder so that's four done that means we've only got 38 to go for this chip at least okay that's all of the joints done let me just give this thing a bit of a poking just to help make sure that flux and solder is not building up in the inside there sometimes it can just get the solders just sitting inside there and then it goes a bit crusty when the flux mixes with it and then it ends up being blocked up so in theory this chip is loose yes is it obvious which way around it goes yes it's got a good notch there and there's a good notch shown there and yeah, so that came out really easy it's got weird marks on the back of it but that is just flux residue from when it was manufactured see there are links on the underneath it that would have been pressing against it anyway so since that came out really easy i've already marked that one with a cross to what's going on here okay let's just turn this off and on again so i already marked the chip with a cross so that i can tell that that is the dead one now we'll get the board off of this machine the donor board and we'll steal the chip from it now we're going to desolder the chip from this board which is the good chip and hopefully it will stay in good condition right we'll just fast forward through all that okay we're ready to pull that out it's been desoldered we've got to unclip the brackets of the display allow that to move forward easily now we can reach in and get this chip out the good chip well, the joins on this one didn't want to desolder as easily as the other one okay that's the good one put that back over there with the machine it belongs to now this is going into here okay that falls into place and it is round the right way the notch there with the notch thingy so let's solder it back in Use the biggest soldering iron tip I've got, that sounds like a good idea. We do two at once with this, don't we? As we discovered with that other chip, it's got the silk screen stuff printed on it, printed around the tabs, around the pads. Okay. So the new chip is soldered in. Probably no bridging. Okay, well let's plug it in and see what happens. If it doesn't work, then we've wrecked two things at once. Those resistors there look like they might be a bit undersized. Look at the state of them. They've gone real dark and so is the board around them. I wonder what they do. Could be something to do with the power supply that drives the tube. So all this was mounted when it goes through the wave solder by the look of it. There's the 
the little bits of the clip that come through the board are a bit sort of crusty looking on the end. So they would have gone through a solder wave or solder bath. They have lots of glass in them so they won't melt that easily. Okay, let's plug this in and see what happens. Oh, look at that. Comes on now. Great, so we fixed it by replacing this chip, I guess. Seems to do all the right things, doesn't it? In that case, since we're so excited about what just happened, let's take this board out and extract its chip and stick that in at the original board. So we end up with only the stuff that originally came out of this machine in it, but in a repaired state. Since that's a bit more complete, isn't it? So we're going to extract this board. We get things we get to pull that. Unplug this thing that they say. Oh, look, this one doesn't even have the caps on it. I must have cut them off because they're in really bad shape. Alright, so this board's got the good chip on it. This board here is the original one. You see it's got the caps. I unplugged that wire to disconnect them. And we'll take the bad chip out. And then we'll be ready to take that good one out and transfer it over to get this shielding plate thing off okay desolder all this there's a foot pedal which turns on the vacuum for the desoldering tool okay 63 to go I need two so I can have one in each hand we can do both rows of the chip at the same time Didn't feel like it was going as well. I think some legs didn't fully release. Oh, okay, so there's some bumps on some of the legs. Got it out. Bent the legs a little bit. That's okay, because this is the dead one, supposedly. Alright, now we got to get the, the good one out. So we better do that one carefully. Okay, that's the shielding thing out of the way. So now we got to rescue a good chip. I see how it gets balls on it, it's because if there's a lump of solder on the outside because these legs are so close it will transfer a little ball onto the leg next to it okay so that should be our good chip 64 pin dip great just solder 64 connections still around the right way, good, we do not want to solder it in around the wrong way Bridging on that. How oh, is the soldering? I suppose we should clean the board properly. We can hose it with some isopropyl alcohol and wipe it with a cloth. Let's try it out. Put this cover thing back on. This weird nut and bolt thing. Don't know why they have that. Oh, I know why they have that. It's to ground it, obviously. See, there's a, a metal ring there. That's what the point of that nut and bolt is. That's why it was done up so tight. It's a good solid connection. Anyway, let's mount up this board. Okay, all that stuff's clipping into place. Ah, oh, yeah, not that you can see any of that. Okay, so we've got the board mounted in. The wires are done up. Let's turn it on. Okay, look at that. We've got a clock flashing. Power it up. We've got the channel selection. set the clock and it runs great so I think we've solved well 
we we correctly um, worked out that these two chips are the fault. And I've been thinking about that a little bit. Why would these two burn out? I probably already explained it in the video earlier, but my guess is that the bad connection on this transistor here used as the 6 and then 5 volt regulator, bad connection on that caused some kind of spike on the power supply. Must have been while it was playing or in use, and that caused it to just pop both those chips. And it got stuck there, and that's why we saw that damage on the pin controller from it just sitting in play mode, squished up for years, probably. Just replace the chips. So if it was real service center back in the day type thing, you would order these from the part number in the service manual and replace them. Probably using that same vintage Weller desoldering tool. So let's mount these boards up properly now. That put itself in, which is good. So that's all mounted in how it was originally. These front boards though, they're a bit of a tricky thing to get in. Unplug signals. And I'm thinking maybe we should replace the capstan since that one's damaged. We'll get the one out of the other machine. And maybe the head too, because I think the one in the other machine's in better condition, so perhaps we'll steal those two parts and put them into here. And then we'll have an even better working machine, perhaps. So there's little tracks here that these wires need to go down into. We can get the that display to pull itself down as well, since we've bent it out so much and these clips don't really do much. Wires squish out of the way. Again, there's three red screws for that. Yeah, that's good, that's nice. All that stuff is in. Let's have a look at what we'd need to do to change the capstan. We've also got these belts underneath, which are a bit stink. Video head as well. You have to pop that thing off. Oh, it's not easy to unclip. And then there's these connectors. Then the capstan. Can probably just pull it out from the back. I don't think we'd have to see the bearing that it runs in is screwed in from this side. It's a black plastic assembly, but I don't think we need to take that out. Okay, so we can un undo that. The thrust plate thing. That off. Belt, which I better clean, and that just snaps off. Oh, comes off true to the magnetism. The stator comes off with these screws. And the one's already done by that thrust plate thing. That comes off. That should just slide out. And you can see there's damage on it because it's Gone a bit rusty, although it's actually cleaned. We've cleaned it by ripping it out because now the crust is stuck on the other side there. Uh, so I'll just get the one out of the other machine and then we'll stick it back in to here. Okay, here's the one from the other machine where the shaft is very nice and clean. So we'll insert that. And then there's a little sleeve thing that we have to squeeze over it. Just here from the other machine. Uh, so we can put this back together. Stator. Okay, that was the old one. We'll keep all that old stuff together. This new one, a yeah, little, not new, it's just from the other machine. A little bit cleaner perhaps. And then I've got the thrust plate thing from the other machine. So we'll keep that one, because that's probably adjusted to suit this. And that clips into there, just held on by the magnetism. Now we need to clean these gears a bit. And I'm also going to loosen the head off so that we can get that out easily.
put the heat out of the other machine. Still not in the best shape, but we'll compare them and decide something. Just clean that. Clean this as well. And we'll clean the belt. So it might live another day. Not a very long day, but it will live for a little while, just enough to prove this machine is way better than it was before. Do the same with the loading belt. Okay, now we've got to clean those pulleys as well. Keep it in good condition. Oh, that's really dirty. Okay. Feels good now. Great. Now, head's gonna come out, and the old, that little bearing thing. Perhaps we'll do that first. To pick the little bit of foam out of there. And maybe we should have replaced the bearing shaft thing as well. Just to get the oil off of the, the shaft. Before we stick a tape back in there. Little Thingy back on, and then we've got to clean it again. Great, we've got a really nice cap stand in there now. So we're going to undo these wires, and then we'll take the head off. Just do the whole thing instead of trying to updo do just the upper drum. Now we've loosened the screws, so we just have to take those out. The Sims type screws with a split washer on them. Now we haven't removed the screw, no, no, we haven't removed the wire from the motor yet. Only the video ones. We're going to pull this up. Without smashing it into anything. And then we can get the other connection out. Now we can look at them. Got crust on it. Got really kind of dull bits on it. But this one here is not much better, but it is better, the, the dull bit is a lot thinner along the top edge, so I think we'll go with swapping it to this one. Well, we might as well now that we've gone this far. Let's drop that down into position. This wire's out of the way. We'll connect those up now while we're here. And that really hard to get on and off metal cover thing. Okay, we're going to put screws back in to hold this head in. Great. Head replaced. Whole head drum assembly replaced. Now we're going to have to clean all that because we've been touching it. Got the loading mechanism in though. I'm going to take that out again. Okay, that's a basic clean done. We've got to get some paper to do the head. Oh, the back tension band. We really need to change that. I wonder if the one in the other machine is in good condition. If it is, we'll take it. Now, that means we've got to take them. Okay, we've still got quite a bit of dirt off of that. We're just polishing the aluminium now, aren't we? Wow, okay. Back tension band, we need to sort that out. Which means we've got to take this mechanism out again. The loading cassette loading mechanism. Okay, which means then we've got to set up the back tension tension again. Let's see, I'll look for some parts. So I've found, found another tension band. This is a more modern one, it uses a plastic strip rather than the brass or whatever that is. And I got that out of the other machine because I looked at my collection of these things and they're all wrecked and old. Probably because all the good ones I had are in other machines in my collection. So normally to set this thing up, to set up the back tension position, because that's adjustable there, you would fit a jig in, which you adjust so that that rests on the edge of the jig. Just described in that D1 manual here, tension post, sits against that edge and you adjust it. But I don't have one of those. And let's try something. So this is out, and if we can hold this in a way that I can still load a cassette in. 
try to touch anything. The procedure is you put a tape in and then you turn off the machine. When it gets into play position. So put it into play mode and then you just turn it off. And I'm thinking, can we mark the position of that? And then use that as a way of putting in the new band and getting it lined up properly. Pretty much perfectly lined up with where that's pointing right now. So we can just use that as a guide. Let's try it. Yeah, so you can see the felt strip has just come unglued from that. I have glued them back on in the past. Use a bit of contact cement. The newer ones, the felt strip comes all the way to the end and it gets crimped into the little plastic thing. So that way they can't come off. So, yeah, so there's been various improvements over the years. We'll just get that tweaked up to exactly the same position as before. So that as the tape tightens, it will pull this arm in slightly and that will relieve tension on the supply reel. So it hits a balance point where the tape is kept at a precise tension around the head, not too slack and not too tight. I was thinking we could take this thing out and do something with it while we're in here. Now yeah, let's just do that. While we're here, there's a split washer on this that has to come off. It's usually the hardest part is getting the split washer off without destroying it. See, so that is fully perished. But I might have another one that we can put in. Is it worth it? Let's see. Got this container of parts from salvage from machines, and pretty good chance they're all in worse condition. Uh, that one might be better. I don't know if you can order this stuff anymore. It's also old now, and who would want it? I think we've already got the best condition one on the machine, so yeah. So we'll just give it a bit of a, a wiping down and hope that that's good enough for it. Well, good enough to demonstrate at least. I think there's some sort of rubber renewing stuff you can wipe onto it, but I can remember that being used in photocopier servicing in the, the belts and rollers and things which pick up the paper from the paper trays. This good juice that you could put on them and made them nice and sticky again. Don't know what that is at the moment to buy it. Put this back in. Back on the split washer. Back on this the brake tensioning thing. Should be good to go. Now hold this carefully and it should get our tape back when we power it up. Get on threading. Great. Okay, so we'll reinstall the floating mechanism, then we'll just check the back tension and things. Special testing cassette shell. You've got to be careful with this. Some of them you need to have the flap still on it because some machines will jam if you try and load a cassette that doesn't have the, the flap. But uh, these older machines are fine. You just got to make sure to block off the end sensors. Otherwise, yeah, it won't work. Now we messed something up. It's like I've ruined something, but I don't know what it is. Okay, we'll take it all out again then. Oh, okay. The crust of... There's so much dust and crust in this thing that there's a lump of stuff there sitting in the gear. A little lump of, I don't know what it is, a stone? Yeah, all these gears and these tracks are very dusty and hairy. Okay, so I think that's what it was, a little stone thing just rammed in the gears. Oh, there's more of that stuff on this side. 
You see it there, there's two more lumps of some stuff. Alright, this time. Okay. We have a pretty weak take up, unfortunately, because that idol is a bit pluned. Uh, but our back tension really tight. But the little lever, that should be fine. Really good tension for rewind and fast forward. So I think we're done. It's all awesome now. Oh, we haven't even tried it. And since we changed the head, let's try that. Yeah, it actually shows you the TV stuff. Seems to be working good. Now the capture can't see the fast forward picture. It's interesting. No way, DW. I'm get these. Great. Okay, we'll try that tape that's got the hi-fi sound on it and see if that's changed at all since changing the head. Hadn't used the magic of the five on me. I'd be ruling Trollzopolis by now. But at least I've got enough power to send you out into the world. Hi, darling! It's my lucky night! No, hasn't got any better. But, yeah, I think that's more of the recording than the, the machine, probably. I have to try and see if I've got another tape somewhere with hi-fi on it. Or perhaps we should try making one in this machine. That sounds like a good idea. We've found this thing. Which is bizarrely a DVD camcorder. I don't know what the point is of recording onto a DVD, but... Uh, there you go. Uh, let's try recording onto this tape there. The one that came up through the machine. It's probably causing problems on the sound, isn't it? I'll just mute that for now. So it turns out there is a auto level control for the audio. And I've enabled that. So hopefully the the microphones on this are picking it up. We'll make a nice video about let's explore a VCR with you know, interlacing issues. There's also a click noise I can hear. Not sure what's causing that. Okay, let this go for a while. I need to start putting the casing back on, back together on this thing. What other bits and pieces? What did that come from? You can see the audio level there. Great. Not sure about that, de that lack of de interlacing. There's something I can do about that. I thought it was already set on a deinterlace mode. No, oh, it wasn't. Okay. Alright, there you go. It's properly deinterlace now. Great, let's stop this and see what we recorded. If anything. Oh. Yeah, there's not enough take up, unfortunately. It's a shame. I guess we could go into play mode and then go into rewind. Oh, yeah, look at that. It has recorded something. Okay, let's see. See the audio level there? Great. about that de-interlacing. There's something I can do about that. Okay, so the sound isn't so good in hi-fi when it's recorded itself either, so I, yeah, I guess there's something else a bit messed up about this. Yeah, that's a shame. I thought the sound would be better. Anyway, I think we've um, I think we've done this VCR now. 
yeah, it's as far as I'm willing to go at the moment. We've got so many others to move on to. Yeah, it's a shame. We need a new idle attire, I think, for that. Oh no, it's actually the belt on the bottom that's slipping. Okay, so it needs new belts as well. Because the gearing's too high when that's that's huge and that's small. With a run-up it probably would have worked uh, if it had been rewinding the whole tape. Yeah, there we go. So that's the National NV870. This is the original front panel. I guess we should put that back on so it looks nice. When you're putting that on, you've got to make sure that the these line up with the controls on the front. It's not the easiest thing to put on. So there we are. Two chips replaced and a few other bits and pieces. And we've got a working machine now. Cake should I bake? Chocolate! See, Arthur, even Kate agrees with me about the plate. So put the cover back on. Good day at school, honey. And it will be all done. And if you have any ideas what could be wrong with the hi fi sound, why is it making that strange noise and not able to lock in and go clear, then please let me know. Otherwise, that's it for. National NV 870.